My name is Fritz Kao, and I made this video with the intentions of informing people of historical facts, past, present, and future. I don't know if you're ready to see what I want to show you, but unfortunately you and I have run out of time. If you consider yourself a true American or care about the future of your children, it's dire that you watch the entirety of this video all the way through. how free you think you are and what you can do you do something this government doesn't want they'll plant dope on you they'll find something in your hotel room they will do something and you'll be taken off or like usually if you're a researcher you'll just disappear and no one will know where you are and nobody wants to talk about it I know there's 12 guys who run the fucking world and uh, they own every company and you know it's, it's, it's fact you can look it up I'm not a conspiracy nut this is all on paper they have us they control us they are our masters wake up they're all about you all around you Let's start from the beginning. Now pay attention. Show this video to everyone you know. If if we are not able to ask skeptical questions, to interrogate those who tell us that something is true, to be skeptical of those in authority, then we're up for grabs for the next charlatan, political or religious who comes ambling along. It, it's a thing that Jefferson laid great stress on. It wasn't enough, he said, to enshrine some rights in a, in a constitution or a bill of rights. The people had to be educated and they had to practice their skepticism and their education. Otherwise, we don't run the government. The government runs us. To preserve our independence, we must not let our rulers load us with perpetual debt. We must make our choice between economy and liberty or profusion and servitude. I place economy among the first and most important of Republican virtues, and public debt is the greatest of the dangers to be feared. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their money, first by inflation and then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of their property until their children will wake up homeless on the very continent their fathers conquered. How is money created? Let's listen to Stormcloud Gathering explain it for us. This isn't something we're taught in school. Once you have it explained to you in simple terms, you'll understand why. The process begins with the Federal Reserve when they loan out money to the U.S. government and to other entities. You've probably heard this talked about before, especially in regards to the interest rate on those loans, which the Federal Reserve raises and lowers depending on the economic conditions. But what's never talked about in the mainstream is the fact that the Fed isn't actually loaning out money that they have. They are merely typing those dollars into existence on a computer. You may be inclined to believe that this money is based on some physical backing like gold, but you'd be mistaken. Federal Reserve hasn't owned any gold since the 1930s. We don't. The Federal Reserve does not own any gold at all. We have not owned gold since 1934. Um, so we have not engaged in any gold swaps. When the Federal Reserve loans money to the U.S. government, the U.S. government gives the Federal Reserve government bonds in exchange. These bonds are simply written promises to pay back the money that was loaned to them with interest through taxation. So to be clear here, the government is taking out a loan from a bank that is creating that money out of thin air, and they're expecting you, the taxpayer, to cover that loan. The absurdity of this arrangement is even more obvious when you realize that up until 1913, the U.S. government created its own money and had no need for a bank to play the part of a middleman. 
That new money loaned out by the Federal Reserve enters circulation through the banks, accumulates in the banks, and in the end, the banks end up holding all the cards. Not necessarily for the reasons you may imagine. Contrary to popular belief, the majority of money in circulation isn't actually created by the Federal Reserve, but rather by the ordinary banks that businesses and individuals use for their checking, savings, and mortgages. How is this possible? Well, like the Federal Reserve, ordinary banks are allowed to loan out money that they don't have. There are, of course, restrictions. Banks are only allowed to loan out 10 times the amount of money that they actually have. So if Wells Fargo has $1,000, they can loan you $10,000, and they expect you to pay back that $10,000 plus interest. This is called fractional reserve banking. 75% of all money in circulation is created in this manner. Now, as bad as this may seem, this is really only the tip of the iceberg. Most banks structure payment plans so that for many years, you're paying almost nothing but interest, and only start paying down the principal gradually. The result of this strategy is that in most cases you pay far more in interest when you purchase a house than the house itself is worth. So here's the real question. If all money is created through loans, where does the money come from to pay for the interest? Let's say we reset the system to zero, loan a thousand dollars into existence and charge 7% interest. We now have a total of a thousand dollars in the system but we owe $1,000 plus interest, and that's more. The interest ensures that there's always more debt than money in circulation, because the money to pay the interest doesn't exist. Never has, never will. This would be obvious if there was only one loan being issued to one person in this manner, but when performed on a global scale, the reality is hidden, and is transformed into a game of musical chairs where the person ending up without a seat faces bankruptcy and financial ruin. Because every dollar in existence is tied to a debt, this creates an unseen force that draws those dollars back to the banks, kind of like gravity attracts a physical object to Earth. So let me make this clear. All currency besides America's currency is backed by gold. Our currency is fake because it is typed into existence by the Federal Reserve. They pump hundreds of billions of dollars of fake money into the economy every month. This causes a bubble that has to burst and when it does everyone loses their homes to the banks. Also they use the interest gathered on this typed up imaginary and fake money to buy real assets, your businesses, real estate, etc. Every hour that you work to pay back a loan or to keep the government from throwing you in jail over income taxes is an hour work for the banks. The total receipts from personal income taxes just barely covers the interest on the national debt. And even the principal for that debt all ends up back in the hands of the banks. And remember, that bank created that money out of nothing. Once you understand that the money that banks loan out isn't actually an asset, but is in fact a piece of legal fiction, it should be clear that you're working for these banks for free. This is a cleverly disguised form of slavery. If you manage to pay your monthly payments, then you are a successful slave, and you are allowed to keep the material comforts that come with that status. But if for some reason you fail to make those monthly payments, then the bank or the IRS comes to take your house, your car, and anything else you have of value. And if somehow, even with this enormous financial advantage, the banks still get themselves into trouble, you, the taxpayer, will be forced to bail them out. No matter what, the banks win. To say the game is rigged is an understatement. Debt-based money is a masterpiece of social engineering, the ultimate tool of the ruling elite. Yet in reality, the whole thing is nothing more than a construct of belief. Our chains are the chains of the mind, and the path to freedom must also begin in the mind. If we want a better future for our children and grandchildren, then we must work right now to reach a critical mass of awakening. The Federal Reserve then made so much profit they were able to buy presidents and politicians. They started the Bilderberg Group, where they would control things behind closed doors. They are known as the Shadow Government. 
They call themselves Freemasons or members of the Skull and Bones Society. Do not forget these titles, they will come up later, but most refer to them as the Illuminati. In 1945, the Bretton Woods Agreement established the dollar as the world reserve currency, which meant that international commodities were priced in dollars. The agreement, which gave the United States a distinct financial advantage, was made under the condition that those dollars would remain redeemable for gold at a consistent rate of $35 per ounce. The United States promised not to print very much money, but this was on the honor system because the Federal Reserve refused to allow any audits or supervision of its printing presses. In the years leading up to 1970, expenditures in the Vietnam War made it clear to many countries that the U.S. was printing far more money than it had in gold. And in response, they began to ask for their gold back. This of course set off a rapid decline in the value of the dollar. The situation climaxed in 1971 when France attempted to withdraw its gold, and Nixon refused. On August 15th, he made the following announcement. I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. The United States. This was obviously not a temporary suspension, as he claimed, but rather a permanent default. And for the rest of the world who would entrust the United States with their gold, it was outright theft. In 1973, President Nixon asked King Faisal of Saudi Arabia to accept only U.S. dollars as payment for oil and to invest any excess profits in U.S. Treasury bonds, notes, and bills. In return, Nixon offered military protection for Saudi oil fields. The same offer was extended to each of the world's key oil-producing countries, and by 1975, every member of OPEC had agreed to only sell their oil in U.S. dollars. The act of moving the dollar off of gold and tying it to foreign oil instantly forced every oil importing country in the world to start maintaining a constant supply of Federal Reserve paper. And in order to get that paper, they would have to send real physical goods to America. This was the birth of the petrodollar. Paper went out, everything America needed came in, and the United States got very, very rich as a result. It was the largest financial con in recorded history. Iraq began selling its oil exclusively in euros. This was a direct attack on the dollar and on U.S. financial dominance, and it wasn't going to be tolerated. We have heard that half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth, worth it. Miss Albright, what exactly was it that was worth killing 500,000 kids for? And then suddenly 9-11. When a demolition team brings down a building, they always make slanted incisions to the supporting steel columns using a compound called thermite. They found industrial thermite covered incisions on all the steel columns of the World Trade Centers. Jet fuel cannot even melt through a jet engine. It cannot melt through the stronger metal that the World Trade Center was made of. It's only possible for an industrial machine plus thermite to make such precise incisions. The planes crashed 57 floors high, and those columns, cuts, were below the World Trade Center. There's no way the jet fuel could have even been 
close to those steel columns, and even if they did, it wouldn't have been able to cause that damage. How did the thermite get onto those steel columns? Thermite is not found in jet fuel. The cuts are also slanted, which is the standard cut demolition teams use when bringing down a building. Also, how did World Trade Center 7 come down? How did two planes destroy three towers? It just doesn't make sense. And if you haven't heard about World Trade Center 7 falling, it's because the powers that be don't want you to know about it. This is just scratching the surface of evidence, proving 9-11 was an inside job. Keep doing research yourself. Don't believe anything you can't prove without your own research. Pause the video and Google Operation Northwoods. It's a real declassified U.S. mission. The U.S. government wanted to blow up two towers, killing thousands, and blame it on another country to go to war, similar to 9-11, to keep the Fed scam going. It was signed off by all the branches of the military, so the military will do something like that. Never forget that. And it was signed off by Congress. The only person who didn't sign off on it was JFK. It was later signed off by All mainstream news stations by law to create propaganda to go to war. You're saying our government plans to commit a terrorist act against a domestic area? There you go. Indicting the entire government. Faction. A small faction for what possible gain? The Cold War is over, John. But with no clear enemy to stockpile against, the arms market's flat. But bring down a fully loaded 727 into the middle of New York City, and you'll find a dozen tin pot dictators all over the world just clamoring to take responsibility and begging to be smart bombed. I can't believe it. This is about increasing arms sales. In the show, a rogue group of our government was going to hijack a commercial airplane, then remotely fly and crash it into the World Trade Center. I need to know our flight plan. I'm mapping the data now. The corner of Liberty and Washington. Or Manhattan. World Trade Center. I'm going to crash the plane into the World Trade Center. In the show, the heroes saved the day. It's a shame it didn't work out like that on 9-11. Makes you wonder why that show was cancelled shortly after that episode. Huh. Almost 3,000 people died on 9-11. 2,500,000 people died in wars justified by 9-11. And that total gets higher and higher as each day passes. The U.S. government, with the assistance of the mainstream media, began to build up a massive propaganda campaign claiming that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and was planning to use them. In 2003, the U.S. invaded, and once they had control of the country, oil sales were immediately switched back to dollars. Well, if it was a real conspiracy, don't you think the media would talk about it? Don't you think it would be on the front page of the news? Don't you think? Well, if it was a real government conspiracy, why do you think they would let that be on the news? It's the third time I've said that. I'll probably say it three more times, see? In my line of work, you've got to keep repeating things over and over and over again for the truth to sink in, to kind of catapult the propaganda. You know the news, they read off a script, right? You know the news reporters do that, right? No? No, you don't know that? No, I trust my news. They are more credible than you. 
Well, if you filled up your gas tank lately, then you don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. And you don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. So you don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. And you don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you gas prices are back on the rise. President, earlier this year you told us you had ordered your administration to cease and desist on payments to journalists uh, to promote your agenda. You cited the need for uh, ethical concerns and the need for a bright line between the press and the government. Your administration continues to make the use of video news releases, which are prepackaged news stories sent to television stations, fully aware that some or many of these stations will air them without any disclaimer that they are produced by the government. Controller General of the United States this week said that raises ethical questions. Does it raise ethical questions about the use of government money to produce stories about the government that wind up being aired with no disclosure that they were produced by the government? Uh, there, there is a Justice Department opinion that says these, um, these pieces are within the law so long as they're based upon facts, not advocacy. And I expect our agencies to adhere to that ruling. Well, if you filled up your gas tank lately, then you don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. You don't need us to tell you that gas prices are back on the rise. Well, for decades, it's been rumored that the United States government was secretly sponsoring the smuggling of cocaine into the country. Federal officials have long denied such speculation, pointing out the billions of dollars spent intercepting drugs. Newly released documents and testimony from Justice Department and DEA officials now show the stories of government running cocaine are in fact true. I mean, let's remember here, the people we are fighting today, we funded 20 years ago. And we did it because we were locked in this struggle with the Soviet Union. They invaded Afghanistan, and we did not want to see them control Central Asia. And we went to work. And it was President Reagan, in partnership with the Congress, um, led by Democrats, who said, you know what, sounds like a pretty good idea. Let's deal with the ISI and the Pakistani military, and let's go recruit these Mujahideen. And, Let's great. Let's get some to come from Saudi Arabia and other places importing their Wahhabi brand of Islam so that we can go beat the Soviet Union. And we, guess what? They retreated. They lost billions of dollars, and it led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. So there's a, a very strong argument, which is wasn't a bad investment to end the Soviet Union, but let's be careful what we sow because we will harvest. So we then left Pakistan. We said, okay, fine. You deal with the stingers that we've left all over your country. You deal with the mines that are along the border. And by the way, we don't want to have anything to do with you. In fact, we're sanctioning you. So we stopped dealing with the Pakistani military and with ISI, and we now are making up for a lot of lost time. I don't want to disturb your listeners who are going to go to bed after watching you. But I think we're three steps from war with Russia. Ukraine's former Prime Minister Yulia Tymoshenko threatens to level Russia to the ground. This came in a leaked phone conversation with another former official that emerged on YouTube. This comes as the United States government debates a loan guarantee for the country's new leadership. I'm as sorry, a diplomat. if you're saying privately behind the scenes that you're cooking up a deal, and then you're saying publicly that this is up for Ukrainians to decide, those are two totally different things. No. The question is, who's provoking uh, this unrest? And you know, w what I know is that you really have to stick close to the evidence. <laughs> Yatsenyuk has become uh, the interim prime minister of the Ukraine. Well, if I were a Russian, I would look at that and say, hmm, <laughs> who, who's responsible for a lot of this? Looks like they're trying to do with the Ukraine what they did to the rest of Eastern Europe, what the U.S. pledged not to do and that is to pluck these countries off one by one and have them join not only the European community, but NATO. 
the Russians aren't going to stand for that. And, you know, the people advising Obama might have warned him. Here's the Kiev Post, the English-speaking newspaper in Ukraine, with this headline. General Dempsey says that the U.S. is ready for military response to Russia if Crimean conflict escalates. This was posted yesterday. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the United States General Martin Dempsey, has claimed that in the case of an escalation of unrest in Crimea, the U.S. Army is ready to back up Ukraine and its allies in Europe with military action. According to the website of the Atlantic Council, Dempsey said that he's been talking to his military counterparts in Russia, but he's also sending a clear message to Ukraine and members of NATO that the U.S. military will respond militarily if necessary. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you want to know what it is? You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! In a letter dated 22 January 1870, Massini wrote to Pike. Now, Albert Pike is this high mason who wrote this, the manual, if you like, of Scottish Freemasonry. He said the following, We must allow all of the federations to continue just as they are. It must appear as things are as they were in the beginning. With their systems, their central authorities, and diverse modes of correspondence between high grades of the same right, organized as they are at present, but we must create a super right which will remain unknown, to which we will call those Masons of high degree whom we shall select. With regard to our brothers in Masonry, these men must be pledged to the strictest secrecy. Through this supreme right we will govern all Freemasonry, which will become the one international center, the more powerful because its direction will be unknown. Now, Albert Pike wrote a letter to Mancini, and that was dated August 15, 1871, in which he propagated that there should be a world order, a one order where all nations are under the control of one central organization. And in order to achieve this, they planned, and there are numerous quotes for this, so I've put a number on the screen, because some will say, I don't trust this, I don't trust that, I don't trust the other. Here are references down there, there are references up there, there will be references in other slides, so it comes from different sources. He said, and this was, by the way, on display in the British Museum, and could be seen there until it was taken away. The First World War, to overthrow the power of the Tsars in Russia, protector of orthodoxy, and bring about an atheistic communistic state. Did that happen? Yes. Now that was written long before this event. Long before this event. This was written in 1871, but this war broke out in 1914. The Second World War, that's also written long before the event, to originate between Great Britain and Germany, to strengthen communism as, as antithesis to the Judea Christian culture and bring about a Zionist state in Israel. Did it achieve this objective? Yes. In fact, after this war, Israel in its present form was reinstated under the protection of Britain. And then, interestingly enough, a Third World War, a Middle Eastern war involving, involving Judaism and Islam and spreading internationally. That's fascinating. Is that uh, on the cards, or what do you think? Now, how were they going to do it? Let's read what Albert Pike wrote about these wars and uh, how they were going to be uh, unleashed. 
He wrote, quote, We shall unleash the nihilist and the atheist, so the destroyer and the atheist, and we will provoke a formidable social cataclysm which in its horror will show clearly to the nations the effect of absolute atheism. Origin of savagery in the most bloody turmoil. Then everywhere the citizens obliged to defend themselves against the minority of revolutionaries will exterminate these destroyers of civilization and the multitude disillusioned with Christianity will receive the pure light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer. The destruction of Christianity and atheism both conquered and exterminated at the same time. Wow, what a clever plan. That which we must say to the crowd is, we worship a God, but it is the God that one adores without superstition. To you, Sovereign Grand Inspectors General, we say this, that you may repeat it to the brethren of the 32nd, 31st, and 30th degrees. The Masonic religion should be, by all of us initiates of the high degree, maintaining the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. If Lucifer were not God, would Jesus calumny spread false and harmful statements about him? There's only one difference between the Luciferian philosophy and the fall of man is that those who talk about the fall of man believe in God The ones who believe in the Luciferian philosophy do not. Here's their story. It's a metaphor. They don't believe that there ever was a God, or that there ever is a God, aside from man himself. And man has not reached that state yet, but can, and this is what they teach in the lodges, that if you perfect yourself as the temple of the God within, and become Christed, you've all heard this in the New Age movement, you too can become God. It's taught in every Masonic temple in this land. Every secret brotherhood, every secret society, every mystical temple, every occult organization teaches the Luciferian philosophy. They do not believe in Lucifer, they do not believe in any entity called a devil, and they do not believe in God. It is a mistake for you to assume that they do. Their whole purpose throughout history has been to teach a small number of people how to become adept at controlling everyone else. And presenting their societies as desirable to the profane, so that you'll go knock on the door and say, hey, can I be a member and be initiated? With the promise of learning some great secret. What is that secret? The secret is how to control everybody else. And you never understand how to control everybody else until you get to the top of this pyramid of initiation. Most people never make it past the third step. All above that are carefully chosen and nurtured and taught. And Americans for all these years have been looking around for the enemy. They've never been able to find an enemy. You see, the enemy has always been here. It's your uncle, your aunt, your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your nephew, your nieces who belong to the fraternal orders collectively known as the mysteries. There's a method to their madness. There's really not much method to yours because you're operating from a place of ignorance and until you change that you're going to be bumbling around, bumping into each other, saying and doing the wrong things, not understanding the nature of your en enemy and if you don't understand the nature of your enemy and the weapons they use, you cannot fight that enemy. I found a sermon from the 30s by Dr. Alva J. McLean, and he went into these Masonic lodges and got some material. He was a preacher and found all this stuff and was preaching against white 
nobody should join them, why they're satanic. One of the arguments he used was, George Washington owned slaves. How can you be a decent person when you own another, you say you own another human being? Freemasons have a very racist history. She was, you know, you know her story, don't you? She was an actress that was, um, was a, um, she was kind of a foul mouth person, What's a you know, and she, and she hated the whole um, Hollywood scene and she expressed her hatred for them publicly. So then there's this big conspiracy amongst a judge, a very well-known, prominent judge here in Seattle and a bunch of other people who had ties with Hollywood and they basically just set her up and ruined her life, you know. They um, you know, had some pictures taken of her when she was arrested for drunk driving and um, it just, it was a big huge scandal and she eventually was sent to a mental institution and given a lobotomy. And that's why she was uh, institutionalized right over there. I was like, all right, let's go ahead and do it, and then let's jet. And I didn't have approval over the thing. So that's one picture, I must say, that I felt kind of weird about. Yeah. Wish you hadn't done it? A little bit, yeah, to be honest. Getting burned by the fire she lit herself. It's so easy in her business. Her first deal with the publicity devil was made even before she could read. She was a gymnast turned dancer, turned contest star. This is rare footage of her singing in a talent competition. He's still an idol of yours? Yeah, I definitely, I mean, I think that he's done, I mean, I mean, if you really think of a genius that he is, I mean, he's brilliant. And Billie Jean, all the old stuff that he used to do, I think he's great. You think all the stuff written about him is untrue with little kids? I want to think that's untrue. I choose to believe that's untrue. Yeah. Do you like your voice? Do I like my voice? Um, oh, I'll be completely honest. I think my voice is okay. I like the feeling that I get when I sing. It's not so much my voice. It's a state that I go in when I sing that I really like. This spasm of publicity about what happened in, from Mexico to London. It was pretty rough, yeah. Um, yeah, it's kind of weird. Ah, weird. Hello. Um, oh my goodness. Hello. Ew, strong Brittany. Um, yeah, it was a weird. Corey Feldman has no idea what it's like not to be famous. He was just three years old in this McDonald's commercial. McDonald's gift certificates. I literally was famous before I knew my own name. His roles defined the 80s. Goonies. This was my dream, my wish. Stand by me. You call my dad a loony again, and I'll kill you. License to drive. But being famous so young, he says, caused serious damage to him and his friends. Do you feel like you missed out on a normal childhood? <laughs> what childhood? <laughs> I don't know what that means. I can tell you that the number one problem in Hollywood was and is and always will be pedophilia. That's the biggest problem for children in this industry. The casting couch even applies to children. Oh yeah. Not in the same way. It's all done under the radar. Nobody talks about pedophilia. It's the big secret. And it's widespread? Oh, yeah. I was surrounded by them when I was 14 years old. Surrounded. Literally. Didn't even know it. It wasn't until I was old enough to realize what they were and what they wanted and what they were about and the types of people that were surrounding me till I went, oh, my God, they were everywhere like vultures. Vultures who Feldman says abused him and his best friend, the late child actor Corey Haim his co-star in The Lost Boys. Well, what happens if my mom is dating the head vampire? 
Feldman says the trauma of that pedophilia contributed to Haim's death. You know, there's a lot of good people in this industry, but there's also a lot of really, really sick, corrupt people in this industry. And there are people in this industry who have gotten away with it for so long that they feel they're above the law. Hmm. And that's got to change. That's got to stop. There's one person to blame in the death of Corey Haim, and that person happens to be a Hollywood mogul. And that person needs to be exposed, but unfortunately I can't be the one to do it. But the person that knows who did it and knows who he is, is watching right now, I guarantee you. Hmm. Yeah. Intriguing. Yeah. There was a circle of older men that surrounded themselves around this group of kids. And they all had either their own power or connections to great power in the entertainment industry. I am just here to support the President of the United States. The President of the United States is, you know, our boss. But he's also, you know, the President and the First Lady are kind of like the mom and the dad of the country. And when your dad says something, you listen. You know Obama ain't running shit. Pop it on the screen. That nigga ran for office and said, I'm going to stop both wars. And you know these wars is about what? Money, 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 money. Now we all in Afghanistan. You know what we're there for? Opium. The 90% of the world's opium comes from high legend, boy. Now, in the Buddhist religion, they smoke opium. There's 1.6 billion Chinese. In order to control China, you must control opium. Now, if no one thinks you know about American motherfucking history, wherever we land, we don't leave. We already got three bases, permanent bases, in Iraq. We still in Vietnam, still in motherfucking Korea, still got a base in Japan. Everywhere we land, we don't leave. You know what I mean? I thought it was called the United States of America, not the United Empire of Earth. I want the young motherfuckers in here tonight, no matter what your nationality is, turn the motherfucking TV off for one week. And see if you can survive. Motherfuckers are going to a television junkie motherfucking mode. Ain't no TV. I need my remote, nigga. I'm Jones. It's called television programming. They telling you visually to program. You being programmed. You watch it on the news. It was on CNN. It's true. I seen it on Fox. It's real. It's bullshit. Think. It ain't illegal yet. But they working on it. Have you ran into that? And what do you think about that whole Illuminati theory that people could put out there about that? Well, you... <laughs> thanks for that softball question. Uh, some of us are against the Illuminati, and we are against the Illuminati at our own detriment. Mm -hmm. When people are against the Illuminati, then they get punched in the face all the time. The press hates them. Nobody likes them. End quote. We all love Dave Chappelle. Exactly. Dave Chappelle has never been a part of the Illuminati. They don't want him or me or people like us. Um, but now, it's not uh, necessary for us to store up that hornet's nest unless we intend to get stung a million times. I didn't understand that. They had to sting me a million times. I'm still not going to join. Niggas in Hollywood just do the drugs right in front of you and act like ain't shit happened. You in the middle of a goddamn meeting. They, yeah, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the movie with you and then we're gonna we're gonna go back. But Cat Williams was correct when he said those mansion parties and y'all don't understand what go on with that shit, man. Motherfuckers be gay in Hollywood, you never fucking expected. They be having these big ass mansion parties, and the mansion party, the whole mansion is a party, and then it's a separate party in the little rooms. I ain't been famous that goddamn long. I'm excited in a motherfucker to be at the mansion party. And you be looking in all the goddamn rooms, and you fuck around and look in the raw room and shit. Damn door. 
And I'm telling y'all right now, if y'all don't want to believe it, watch in the next couple of years. They coming after Cat Williams. They come, Cat Williams tell too much truth. Caught on tape in a video going viral, comedian Cat Williams allegedly punching a Woodland Target employee. This is Cat Williams right here in one of his previous mug shots. The comedian actor, well known among, among many, but that man says he does not believe this guy's funny. In fact, he says Williams entered this Target store, punched him, and now he is out of a job. Lately, Williams has made a habit of getting into trouble and arrested. There was a bizarre incident with a heckler during a show in Oakland as a bizarre performance took place. Then, a police chase in Sacramento that happened right after this confrontation. My they took my children from me. Yeah, I mean, How I was, terrible is that? I, I didn't sorry about it. You know, let them find guns and drugs now. Is drugs? That, that, that's what it was reported. Sir, you can look at my paperwork. There was no drugs. <laughs> Weed is not a drug. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, okay. do you think that's uh, safe for kids to be around guns and stuff like that? I mean, I'm just curious. How do you keep this kid safe without guns? They were in a lockbox that the police broke. Oh, okay, yeah. I I'm mean, saying, if the police come in and raid my place and break into my gun boxes, you're going to find guns. But these aren't... Well, I'm not in a gang. What difference does it make? Now, now you, you were actually stopped for this and let go because you have a license for no, it, No, right? this is their ninth time coming to my house. The problem was this time they came to my office and took my kids from an office, not from my house, from an office. So now when I can't have my kids at my office, That's an issue. I must be yeah, yeah, the definitely. most terrible black dude. <laughs> Martin Luther King and Malcolm X ended up dead True. for telling the truth. So as a comedian, I don't think it won't happen to me. I think They've thrown me in jail 36 times in 36 months, and I think I, you've never seen me in a court of law. That means they're effing with me. Como 4 caught up with Williams as he was ejected from a South Lake Union hotel around 7 p.m. On Sunday, Williams was arrested after an altercation at a nearby restaurant. Police say he argued with customers and threatened the manager with a pool cue. Williams is accused of then throwing a lit cigarette into a family's car, which hit a woman in the face, throwing a rock at that car, and struggling with police officers. A group of fans claims Williams assaulted them after his performance Friday night. Tonight, Williams admitted to us he has had trouble with the law here in Seattle. Seattle this weekend, he made a string of allegations against police and the media. Then he told us because of his bad weekend in Seattle, he's decided to end his stand-up career. I'm just going to go ahead and announce my retirement from stand-up. I'm kind of done. This is... Um, You're not really retired. I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've already discussed it with my kids. I wasn't really going to do it on the Seattle street. You retired from comedy in 2012, and now you're back. Uh, why and why? To come back, it means you went somewhere. And you either went somewhere because your fan base said, have a seat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, yourself or some entity had you take a seat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There, there was a lesson that I needed to learn. Mm -hmm. And um, I, God helps me because he, if you're slow, he understands you slow. Yeah. And so... <laughs> So, <laughs> and, and, and tell us that lesson because I think they need and want to hear it. Well, I'm saying I'm in, a, I'm in a weird position as a person in Hollywood, I'm saying anyway, mm -hmm. uh, just because of the amount of, of truth that I will tell and the fact that I take joy in it. And um, <laughs> there, there's no way that you can tell that much truth without offending certain portions of the population. Mm -hmm. And so now you have to figure out how you're going to handle that. So, so let, me, let, me, let, me, let me ask you this, about the, about the house situation with your house getting burnt down. Do you think the Illuminati has something to do with that to try to send you a message to try to quiet you or? Well, this is something I've never really said on film. I've said it on film, but I have it. I had that particular tape locked away in my safe behind my desk and no one has ever heard me say this. Um, but I think it's time that we kind of get this out in the open that, um, you know, on, on the Occult Science Radio interview and World Star and some other thing, interviews that I've done, I've actually talked about the blood and the human sacrifice. Well, I'm going to look right in the camera and say this. I was supposed to be that blood human sacrifice for public enemy, but I survived it. Do you understand what I'm saying? And since I survived it and I'm talking about it now, now it's imperative that these people silence me. 
plain and simple. I've told you about people that I had to deal with right in front of my door right here. Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, I tell people, look, when you call me, know that this conversation is being listened to. Plain, plain and simple. Um, I can't tell you how many times I, my MySpace, Facebook, email accounts, websites get shut down. Do you understand what I'm saying? I know they, I know they listening. Do you understand what I'm saying? To a degree, I know these days are numbered for me. Do you understand what I'm saying? But um, uh, I have to do what I have to do because I know they got to do what they have to do. My house burning down, that wasn't no accident. I had 3,000 books, man. All my books couldn't even fit in these three rooms. That's real. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, I had a DVD library that'll blow your mind. And to come home, I wasn't even in town at the time. To come home and look at the shell of my house, I'm like, God damn. So I'm walking in, you know, you know, with a, with a wet uh, t-shirt over my mouth. I'm going through, see if I could salvage some things. It was like critical. And then for the insurance company to fight me tooth and nail, even down to the lawyers, man, just probably pay it off. To be an actor is a lonely life. Everybody wants to make it, and you might not make it. Name your price in the beginning. If it ever gets more expensive than the price you name, get out of there. When Martin Lawrence was in that chair, we talked about Blue Streak. Yes, I love that dude. He played a role in your life, I believe. How do you feel about him as a person, as an artist? Martin Lawrence is the guy that showed everybody you can make it from D.C. to Hollywood. You know, when we did Blue Streak, we were promoting it, and Martin had a stroke. He almost died. And then after that, I saw him, and I was like, oh, my God, Martin, are you okay? And he said... I got the best sleep I ever got in my life. That's how tough he is. So let me ask you this. What is happening in Hollywood that a guy that tough will be on the street waving a gun, screaming, they are trying to kill me? Yeah. You've heard the rumors. Actor and comedian Martin Lawrence was apprehended by Los Angeles police officers yesterday after he was discovered in the middle of one of L.A.'s most congested streets, holding up centipedes at passing cars. You've read the reports. He had a body temperature registering at slightly over 107 degrees Fahrenheit. He was in a coma. Oh, Martin's acting like a madman. Now, get the truth. Yeah. What's going on? Why is Dave Chappelle going to Africa? Why does Mariah Carey make a hundred million dollar deal and take clothes off on TRL? It, a weak person cannot get to sit here and talk to you. There ain't no weak people talking to you. So what is happening in Hollywood? Nobody knows. The worst thing to call somebody is crazy, is dismissive. I don't understand this person, so they're crazy. That's bullshit. These people are not crazy. They're strong people. Maybe the environment is a little sick. Oh, I'm dropping dimes tonight. <laughs> I've had a long year, Mr. Lippin. <laughs> I get a call on my cell phone from Hollywood. I'm like, hello, Hollywood. They're like, hello, Dave. <laughs> They're like, that pilot you did for Fox, the, it looks like they want to pick it up. We need you to come out because they want to meet with you. And I was like, well, listen, I can't really come out right now. Got a real bad situation at home. Can we talk about this on the phone? No, no, they would rather meet with you in person. Huh. But you know, like the whore that they turn us into. I jumped on that plane and left my father's bedside, which I regret to this day. Hollywood is a very powerful illusion. And when your dad dies, it kind of just broke the spell, like, oh, this is bullshit. Look, I've been spending so much time doing this. What about my family? What about my friends? Wait, whatever happened to my friends? Damn, I don't even have any friends. And that was it. As far as I was concerned, I was done with show business. I was freaked out, man, with the fame thing and, and being called uh, crazy and drug addict and all these things uh, scared me. You know, just being treated that way. Like, I'm not a person anymore. You say this shit about me in front of my children and 
who, really, like, who the f*** do these people think they are? I walked away from the show twice last season. Nobody asked about it. Nobody asked about that. You know, in, in uh, one of these magazines, Newsweek, it's a very credible magazine. And they're saying, um, you know, maybe I smoke crack. And it was all innuendo. And, and the magazine as credible as Newsweek. I was very surprised that, that this was happening. And the higher up I go, for some reason, the less happy I am. You know, is it going to get to the point where I'm doing a strip tease on TRL or waving a gun on the street, <laughs> saying they're trying to kill me? There's only six studios, man. There's only six agencies, man. This is a small, controlled thing. I mean, I'm a conspiracy theorist to a degree. Like, when I, I connect dots that maybe shouldn't be connected, I don't know. But certain dots, like when I see that they put every black man in the movies in a dress at some point in their career, I'll be connecting them down. Like, why are all these brothers going to wear a dress? That's happened to me. They come in. It's the writer comes in. I think he's the writer. He's like, Dave, listen, we got this hilarious scene where Martin's sneaking out of jail. So he disguises you as a prostitute. <laughs> and he put this dress on, and it, huh? What? The prostitute? No, nah, I'm not doing that. I don't feel comfortable with that. The, that should have been in the discussion. What? You don't feel comfortable with it? I mean, it's a hilarious bit. All the greats have done it. So, well, if all the greats have done it, it's kind of hacky, right? You're right. So why don't we just not do it? Because I don't feel comfortable wearing a dress. Oh, come on, Dave. Listen, we, we got it all set up. We we're supposed to shoot. Every, every minute you waste costs this much money. You know, the pressure comes in. Huh. He said, I'm, nah, I'm not wearing no dress, man. I'm funnier than a dress. Just give me something funny to say. I don't even wear no dress to be funny. What am I, Milton Berle? Blah, 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 blah. You know, we're going like this. And then finally, he's like, ah. And he, he leaves. And then, like, the director comes, Dave. It really would be great if you wear the dress. What is wrong? What is this? Uh, broke back mountain in here? So <laughs> the minute it was clear, I was adamant. I'm not wearing a dress. I'm not wearing the dress. All right. Fine. Think of something else. Guy comes back ten minutes later. The whole new scene. Hot damn! How did you write the scene so fast? <laughs> you know, it's like so. You gotta take a stink. <laughs> Y'all see that guy get tasered at John Kerry's speech on YouTube? Yeah. That shit was the greatest shit of all time. <laughs> For a strategy that has failed. That's the distinction, sir. I first and foremost want to thank you for your time. You spent a lot of time talking to those here today. I want to thank you for coming and being open and honest. Funny question. I'm going to preface it. He's been talking for two hours. I think I can have two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's also voting machines, electronic voting machines in Volusia County, Florida, that county backwards. So amidst all these reports of, of phony, bogus stuff going on, how could you concede the election on the day? How did you concede the 2004 election on the day? When, in this book, it says there were 5 million votes that were suppressed and you won the election. Didn't you want to be president? I'll say, I'm not even done yet. I have two more questions. If you were so against Iran, how come you're not saying, let's impeach Bush now? Impeach Bush now before you can invade Iran. Why don't we impeach him? Impeach Bush. Clinton, Clinton was impeached for what? A blowjob? Why don't we impeach Bush, all right? Also, are you a member of, were you a member of Skull and Bones from college and Bush? Were you in the same secret society as Bush? Were you in Skull and Bones? Thank you for cutting my mic. Thank you. Right. Are you going to arrest me? Excuse me. Excuse me. What are you arresting me for? Whoa, 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 whoa. Why are they arresting me? Did someone do something here? I'm being arrested. Because it's a very important question. What did I do? Get off the way. Get the fuck off me, man. I didn't do anything. Don't tase me, bro. Don't tase me. I didn't do anything. Like that, you taser me, man. <laughs> hell, we like hell. And 900 people are like, no, we're not gonna help you. <laughs> and the best part about it was you could hear John Kerry talking over the whole incident. Did you hear that shit? You just hear him in the background. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Did y'all hear what he asked John Kerry to get himself tasered? Did you hear the question? No. You didn't hear the question? He was like, is it not true, Senator Kerry, that you are a member of Skull and Crossbones, a 
Secret Society with George Bush? And Carrie was like, that's a very good question. And I'm gonna answer that question. <laughs> You were both in Skull and Bones, the secret society. It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? The conspiracy theorists are going to go wild. I'm sure they are. I don't know. I haven't seen the website. Number 322. <laughs> <laughs> you both were members of Skull and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> Is there a secret handshake? Is there a secret code? I wish there were something secret I could manifest. 322, a secret number? We're dear friends, and uh, this is all in fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, Pa was with me once when I first fucked my first faggot. <laughs> And he's been holding that over my head for two years. I fucked a faggot. I just want to say it now so nobody else can tell. I wasn't talking about homosexuals. I'm saying there's a homosexual ritual that they go through in the Illuminati secret societies. In Skull and Bones, they're made to lay in a coffin and masturbate and tell all their sexual secrets. I have no illusions about these cocksuckers. I know there's 12 guys who run the fucking world, and uh, they own every company, and, you know, it's, it's, it's fact. You can look it up. I'm not a conspiracy nut. This is all on paper. There really are 22 families who, who run and own 50% of the mainstream media, which is where we get our news. And, uh, and it's true. It's a fact. You can look it up. I don't, you know, I, I, I can't be this big of an asshole without having the truth to back me up. Every human on this planet is enslaved, whether they know it or not. This is not the crude and primitive slavery of ancient times. It does not rely on whips and shackles to keep the oppressed in their place. These tools have been rendered obsolete by much more sophisticated methods. That most of the enslaved are unaware of their condition and would in fact argue fiercely that they are free is a testament to the effectiveness of these invisible chains. You've heard the expression, money makes the world go round. There's truth in that. Money is the prime motive for human labor in modern civilization. If you want food, shelter, and clothing, you must have money. And unless you're part of that tiny minority that has more money than they could ever spend in their lifetime, then you must work, beg, or steal for that money. That's why you get up in the morning and go to work, even if you hate your job. And that's why the specter of unemployment is more terrifying for most people than the prospect of spending 50 years of their life performing menial tasks within the confines of a fluorescent lit cubicle.
on the back of the one dollar bill, you'll see the crest with the pyramid in it. But that pyramid in the Illuminati consists of three pyramids and a sphinx, but their crest is this crest. The Illuminati is the occult organization that we belong to. It means the light bearers. The eye is Lucifer. The triangle of the capstone is the tribunal of the Rothschild family, which is called the Holy Family. They lead the Illuminati. The Illuminati name's not used much anymore, except by everyday people who find out about it. And the political part has a name in each country, and the United States is called the Council of Foreign Relations. Since the time of World War Wilson, including him, there has never been a president of the United States that was not an Illuminati. You may think you elect the president, but I'm here to tell you, you elect whoever they put up. Now this right here is David Rockefeller. Let me illustrate. Improved public health has caused the world's infant mortality rate to decline by 60% over the last 40 years. In the same period, the world's average life expectancy has increased from 46 years in 1950s to 63 years today. This is a development which, as individuals, we can only applaud. However, the result of these positive measures is a world population that has risen during the same short period of time geometrically to almost six billion people and could easily exceed six billion, eight billion by the year 2020. You need to do some research on David Rockefeller and Henry Kissinger. Depopulation should be the highest priority of the U.S. foreign policy towards the third world. Quote from Henry Kissinger. Control oil and you control nations. Control food and you control the people. Henry Kissinger. So what they're doing is systematically killing off large populations of third world countries. I don't know if a lot from Mr. Rockefeller. And one of the things that we used to talk about was the ultimate plan of the banking industry, what they wanted to accomplish. And the goals of the uh, banking industry, not, not just the Federal Reserve System, but the private banks in Germany and England, all over Italy, all over the world, they all work together. They're all central banks. And they're, and they're all part of the Communist Manifesto. You know, central banking is one of the major planks of the Communist Manifesto. We talk about America being a capitalist country, but yet at the same time we have a central bank that plans everything for us, right? And the graduated income tax is another plank of the Communist Manifesto, right? So right there you have two major planks of the Communist Manifesto that have been brought in because of the Federal Reserve System, okay? So uh, the ultimate goal that these people have in mind is the goal to um, create a one world government where everybody has an, R R an RFID chip implanted in them. All money is to be um, in those chips, right? There'll be no more cash. And this is giving me straight from Rockefeller himself. This is what they want to accomplish. And all money will be in your chips. And so, any, so not, instead of having cash, Anytime you have money in your, in, your, in your chip, they can take out whatever they want to take out whenever they want to. If they say you owe us this much money in taxes, they just deduct it out of your chip digitally. Total control. Total control. And if you're like me or you, and you're protesting what they're doing, they can just turn off your chip. Their goal is to destroy all existing religions, save theirs. All existing governments, save theirs. And shackle the mob in a system of eternal oppressive debt chained to a computer for the rest of their life in a propagandized world to make them believe that they are happy in this system. They're succeeding because the American people don't understand their enemy. They don't even know what's happening. Some people believe we are part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States characterizing my family and me as internationalists and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure. One world, if you will. 
If that's the charge, I stand guilty and I am proud of it. Well, he didn't say New World Order. Oh, oh, so you need him to say New World Order. Okay. All we need is the right major crisis and the nations will accept the New World Order. Just how rich and powerful is Lord Evelyn Rothschild? Historically, the Rothschild family wealth was hidden in underground vaults. The Rothschild's secret financial records were never audited and never accounted for. Their family commissioned biographies give the illusion that their family fortune has dwindled, but researchers estimate their wealth at close to $500 trillion, more than half the wealth of the entire world. They have controlling interest in three major television networks and easily avoid media attention since they own it. They own controlling interest in the world's largest oil company, Royal Dutch Shell. Although Evelyn Rothschild looks like a harmless gray-haired old man, make no mistake about it, Rothschild and his ancestors have hand-picked presidents, crashed stock markets, bankrupted nations, orchestrated wars, and sponsored the mass murder and impoverishment of millions. Historic events we owe to the Rothschilds. Opium trading and opium wars. Thanks, Rothschilds. Slave trading industry. Thanks again, the Rothschilds. There is way more info. Do some research yourself. This is what happens to people who try and expose the elite. Remember what happens to people who try to change the system. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. Never forget. So what do we get now in Barack Obama? Well, I've got videos, by the way. This election, we're going to vet him. I've got videos. This election, we're going to vet him. Okay, Breitbart, no doubt in my mind, taken out. He bragged. I liked Andrew Breitbart, but what he did was incredibly stupid. Really dumb. He yeah. bragged the day before his death that in the morning he was going to reveal shocking information that would stop the Obama campaign. And Mr. that. Mr. Breitbart that big, dropped dead walking home at night yeah. and turned his, his corpse was blood red. He caused the death of Hastings and Tom Clancy because he'd been sharing data with them. There's a connection between Breitbart's death and Hastings and Clancy. All of them. Yeah, all of them. Um, because of the information that Breitbart gave to Tom Clancy, uh, he was working on a novel that would have exposed Obama. Exclusive new details in the death of award-winning journalist Michael Hastings. The FBI said that Hastings was never under investigation despite the journalist's apparent concerns that he was the target of a federal probe. The 33-year-old was killed in a fiery one-vehicle crash early Tuesday morning in Hancock Park. Hastings is best known for a 2010 magazine article that led to the resignation of General Stanley McChrystal, who was the former U.S. and NATO forces commander in Afghanistan. Biggs got an email from Hastings that didn't seem quite right. It reads, hey, the feds are interviewing my, quote, close friends and associates. Perhaps if the authorities arrive at BuzzFeed GQ or HQ, may be wise to immediately request legal counsel before any conversations or interviews about our news gathering practices or related journalism issues. Also, I'm on to a big story and need to go off the radar for a bit. The email was sent just before one Monday afternoon. 
15 hours later, Hastings was killed in this fiery crash. While conspiracy theories circulate on the internet about what might have led to this fiery crash. There are a couple things that stood out in, in my mind when I went up and visited the scene and visited law enforcement. What stood out in your mind? You said you couldn't get the police report. They weren't, they weren't giving that out. Yeah. So what, el what else stood out in your mind? Well, the fact that when you go to mm. the, the L.A. Police Department, then you go to the Fire Department, and you go to the different agencies, they all said they couldn't comment, and some of them said they were told not to comment on the story. So that kind of stands out. If, uh, you know, we look at the NSA, the government says, if you have nothing to hide, don't worry. I think it kind of has a reverse role here. Things that we do know, it was an extremely hot fire, and I've talked to um, military personnel who have said that this is a extremely hot fire, that this is not something you normally see with a car like this. This is a 2013 Mercedes-Benz. Intensity of the fire is very concerning, and also the placement of the engine and the drivetrain, as we see here. They are completely between 150 and 250 feet from the accident. However, the car was going south, and the engine and drivetrain were behind it. And after I spoke with a couple of university physics professors, mm -hmm. they said in an accident like this, the engines and whatnot would go with the forward so velocity of the... So what does your gut tell you in something like this? You've been on a lot of these stories. What, what, are, you, what, are, you, what are you looking at and where are, you, where are you going with this? Well, I'm looking at the possi all possibilities. I mean, he could have been drinking and driving. That's s s certainly something he could have done. He was near the clubs on Sunset Boulevard, so that's a possibility. But I'm more inclined to believe that there were absolutely zero skid marks. So something else happened. Either the car malfunctioned or something was on the car that allowed that to trigger and blow up. Mercedes says their cars just don't blow up. They take great care to, for them not to do so. You said something also very interesting that, that, that cars can be remotely controlled. Is that you, you'd mentioned yeah. something to that effect. A absolutely, and that came out of the University of Southern Cal or of uh, San Diego. Here, they did a report in 2010, which they took like a basic car, like a Nissan Sentra, and using an iPad, like we all have here on the desk. Mm -hmm. uh, they they were able to hack into the car system and uh, you know operate the accelerator, the brakes, windshield wipers, lights, mm -hmm. steering. So there are so many factors in play here. Remote controlled cars and planes. Crazy, huh? Someone could remotely crash a car you're driving. Or crash a plane you're flying on. All they need is an iPad. Wake up. This is no longer the world you grew up in. Cars that don't have computers can't be remotely controlled. Remember that. Have you ever heard of Bill Cooper before? He was killed in his front yard for speaking out about the government and informing the public of its true nature. Any time any system makes you dependent upon anybody or anything or any system, you are enslaved. Understand that doesn't have to be chains of iron. You don't have to be hanging up on a wall. You just have to be obligated. That's all it takes. How many of you watch Pat Robertson? You ever seen the cross in the crown? Do you know what that means? It's the symbol of the Templars. The Knights Templar. It is the symbol of the unification of the church and the government over the people. Is that what you want? Every time any church gets control of government, the people suffer. It has always happened. That's why our founding fathers established a country where that was not supposed to happen, where everybody was free to worship at the altar of their choice. And if you think they were all of one mind, you better think again. How many religions of the Protestant group do you think existed in this country when our founding fathers put together the Constitution? Over 1,500 different groups all claiming they were right, teaching a different dogma, quoting scripture to justify what they said, and everybody else was going to hell. 
So don't give me this Christian nation bullshit, because that's what it is. This nation reflected Christian values because the people who made up the government in the early days were Christian, but none of them agreed with each other, and they still don't today. Seek ye the truth, and the truth will make you free, and nothing else will do it. Jesus Christ has never lied to anybody. Why won't you listen to him? Don't spread a rumor. Spread the truth. And you're all wrong about that, man. When you say you shouldn't get angry, you shouldn't curse. You shouldn't do things that upset other people, because that's what Jesus spent his whole life doing. You know, pious Christians sometimes make me very angry. They don't even know Christianity. They don't know the man they're following. He was a revolutionary. He was a dangerous man. The moment the people in this country cease to be dangerous men, it's going to be the day we cease to have a country. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not pinging on immigrants. Because if I lived in a place that was so terrible I couldn't support my family or put a roof over my head or even find a toilet to go to the bathroom, I would be coming across this border just as quick as they are. You can't fault them for that. It's illegal. You can fault the government for allowing it to happen because it's illegal, it's unlawful. And they're always talking about we've got to follow the law. Truth is, we only have to follow the law that they think is okay. Why do they want these people coming across our borders? Because these people are helpless. They're without money, they're without a home, they're without a job. What are they? Victims. What do victims bring? Give them the vote and you're going to have socialism. That's why they don't try to stem the flood of immigration. It furthers the agenda of socialism. I feel sorry for those people. They're being used. And they're only thought is to find a good place where they can have a good life for themselves and their children. Does everybody understand what I'm telling you? You've often wondered why is it that they don't do anything about this flood of immigrants coming across the border? And I'm not talking about just Hispanics from Mexico, Central and South America. I'm talking about from all over the world. They come here for a better life, not realizing that in coming here and being manipulated and used as they are, they're going to destroy all of their chances for ever having the American dream. They're going to help bring about socialism, which will put them back into slavery again. Have you noticed all across the country right now, they are creating victim classes of people? Why do you think that is? Because victims need care. Once you create a victim that needs care, you have another vote for socialism, don't you? This country is about freedom. Because only with freedom can you have all of the other things that everybody professes that they want. Do you understand what I'm talking about? What is our common bond truly? Freedom. Freedom. Without freedom, you can't be a Christian no matter what denomination you belong to. You can't be a Buddhist. You can't be an American because that's what it's all about. And that's the only thing that it's all about. Nothing else. Nothing else.
gets down to having to use violence, then you are playing the system's game. The establishment will irritate you, pull your beard, flick your face to make you fight. Because once they've got you violent, then they know how to handle you. The only thing they don't know how to handle is nonviolence and humor.